We recently hit a big milestone on the surprising rebirth of belief in God. Season 1 is finally complete. All 30 episodes can now be listened to from start to finish in your podcast provider. Why not go back and listen again? Or even better, tell a friend to start binging. But fear not, it's not the end of the show. Season 2 is coming in January 2025 and we're already at work pulling together more documentary episodes, interviews and live show recordings on the new conversation on God happening in culture. If you'd like to help us meet the production costs of Season 2, I'd be so grateful if you'd consider supporting the show via Patreon or US tax-deductible giving. Silver supporters get early access to episodes and bonus content – Gold supporters also get signed books and a monthly catch-up with me. The links to support are with the show notes or visit justinbriley.com. In the waters of the Pacific, they believe themselves born again. This is a BBC News report from 1971 children of space-age California who will henceforth be children of light. They have sought salvation. They have found their star. You want liberation, man. Just accept the Lord. <laughs> Standing here now, we're about to put an end to the old and the start to the new. <laughs> and so because you really want to turn your life completely and fully over to Jesus Christ, you want him to rule and reign from now on. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Till you find what it is you're looking for. The balding middle-aged pastor baptizing a young convert at Pirates Cove Beach, California was Chuck Smith. 1971 was also the year that Time magazine published a front cover article titled The Jesus Revolution, profiling the many hippies of the 1960s West Coast counterculture turning from drugs and flower power to a new high, the power of the Holy Spirit. Chuck Smith's own role in the movement was recently portrayed in the film Jesus Revolution, starring Kelsey Grammer and Jonathan Rumi, telling the story of the pastor's unlikely friendship with hippie evangelist Lonnie Frisbee. Jeanette tells me you're a pastor. Yes, currently. I know we must seem pretty strange. But if you look a little deeper, if you look with love, you'll see a bunch of kids that are searching for all the right things, just in all the wrong places. So to answer your question, how do I describe my people? They're sheep without a shepherd chasing hard after lies. And the trouble is, your people reject them. So I ask you, Pastor, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? We can only walk through doors open to us. And your church? Well, that's a door that shut. Lonnie Frisbee had been part of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury counterculture movement, experimenting with drugs and Eastern spirituality along with thousands of others during 1967's Summer of Love. He said his Christian conversion happened after meeting God while high on LSD in a remote canyon. He just changed my life. I entered into something that the Bible calls the born-again experience. I was transformed on the inside. I, I became a new creature in Christ Jesus, and the old things passed away. And uh, so I started telling other people about it. I, I wanted everybody to experience the experience of Jesus Christ. But when I first turned on the drugs, I thought that was the truth, so I turned everybody on the drugs. Well, my friends, they just left me. They, they marked me off as a fanatic, and I was crazy, and I flipped out on another trip, just maybe like what I did when I was on LSD. 
except this lasted and it was real and it was solid and it changed my life Another young man searching for meaning along the Pacific coast in 1971 was Greg Laurie, now pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship, one of California's largest churches. His story is also told in Jesus Revolution. Years after the events portrayed in the film, he recalled the explosive birth of the Jesus People movement in an onstage conversation with Chuck Smith, whose Calvary Chapel Church was at the epicenter of the revival. Yeah. Of course, the drug of the time was uh, acid, and yeah. uh, you know it was, the kids were getting high, and yeah. and uh, just kept saying, you know, we've got to reach these kids. They're they just need the Lord, honey. And I said, no, they're dirty hippies, you know. And, uh, yeah, they need a bath, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and I went yeah. to the door, and here's uh, John standing with Lonnie. And, of course, uh, we invited him in, and we sat down and talked. And, right. uh, and he actually then moved into the house and was living there for a couple of weeks. And he'd bring kids over to baptize them in our doughboy pool in the backyard. And now and kids are coming to, the young hippies are coming to Calvary Chapel. This is something nobody else was doing. Because you yourself have been very candid about the fact that you were, you know, resistant at first, the dirty hippies. Very true. But you opened your heart, you overcame your prejudices, you let the kids in. At the height of the Jesus People revival, religious communes were being formed, new Christian music was being created, public evangelism was taking off, and over 500 people were being baptised every week, many with stories of healing and freedom from drug addiction. You know, I'd had like 500 plus LSD trips and I tri had a lot of pseudo-spiritual experiences through the drug scene, but this thing was so impacting to me that I, you know, I'd never heard anybody pray like they really truly were talking to God and I just started weeping. So you're Something saying like that, that the Holy Spirit moved into you so immensely and so hugely all at once that your desires and the needs and the reliance on substances just went No, it was just gone. Away. We were over at Calvary Chapel and they told us to come over here that somebody would pray for my husband, he's blind. Here we go. <laughs> this is going to be good because Lonnie's sitting right here. He looks at the guy and he goes, in the name of Jesus Christ, you can see. I was scared to be with Lonnie because everywhere Lonnie would be, God was doing things. Over time, the converts of the Jesus People movement became leaders in a new wave of non-denominational churches that used contemporary music to reach seekers through fresh forms of evangelism, preaching and prayer. Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, itself birthed many more churches. Greg Laurie. The explosion of your church, a whole new kind of music, praise and worship chorus as well. Guess what? A bunch of guys are getting saved and uh, they're feeling called to serve the Lord. So a guy named Raul Reese, who's uh, a martial arts expert, mm -hmm. goes and starts a Bible study in his dojo where he's teaching students. Uh, a guy named Jeff Johnson goes up to Downey. Another guy named Mike McIntosh goes down to San Diego. Uh, Steve Mays uh, off to South Bay and, and on the list goes. And, and I went off to Riverside and, you know, some time when these little Bible studies grew and all of a sudden in John Corson to Oregon. Yeah. And, and before you know it, we, we have churches sprouting up. And next thing you know, they're big churches. And next thing you know, there's 30, there's 40, there's 100, there's 200. Now there's 1,400 churches. Uh, and that is in the U.S. Of course, when you look at the missions, it just... It's even more. Even much more. Yeah. By some estimates, over a quarter of a million people were converted during the West Coast Jesus Revolution of the late 60s and early 70s. But the Jesus people spread far and wide. My own parents were converted in the British counterpart of the movement. I spent my early years living in a radical Christian commune that they were part of. But whether part of it or not, many Christians today are worshipping in churches deeply influenced by the new music, theology and church styles inspired by the movement led by long-haired evangelists like Lonnie Frisbee. Jesus said, if you 
will confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father which is in heaven. I want you to stand up and receive Christ. Those of you that haven't received him yet, to stand to your feet to receive him. And I'm going to ask you to come up on the stage right now, and we're going to sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. I just want you to come forward. And if you haven't stood to receive Christ, come on up here and receive him right in front of us right now. I need Many have described the Jesus Revolution as the last great American revival. It's been over 50 years since those hippies lined up on the shorelines of Southern California to be baptised. They are now the boomer generation, whose Gen X, Millennial and Gen Z children and grandchildren have steadily slipped away from faith. So was the Jesus People revival just a blip, an anomaly in the otherwise steady retreat of faith giving way to a secular future? I began this series at another shoreline, that of Victorian poet Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, and his memorable description of the melancholy, long withdrawing roar of the Sea of Faith. But I questioned whether the Sea of Faith will always be in retreat, or whether in fact we may be due for a turning of the tide as the story of atheist materialism reaches its furthest ebb. Throughout this series, I've examined the way in which new atheism has waned and how many secular thinkers in the fields of science, culture, history, literature, philosophy and psychology are reconsidering the God question and often pointing millennials in the midst of a meaning crisis back towards the Christian story. We've also heard surprising accounts from many adult converts to Christian faith and, despite its often troublesome history, rumours that today's church may be seeing rumblings of revival among Gen Z. I believe that God is not finished with the church and the conditions may be in place for a possible renewal of Christian faith in the West that could eclipse even the great revivals of previous centuries. But what can those who want to see such a revival in their generation do to welcome the returning tide? One of the hallmarks of the Jesus Revolution was its weirdness, a willingness to embrace the counterculture for Christ. Another mark of the movement was its focus on community, as those early converts created churches ready to receive spiritual seekers. And it was a movement that tapped into the imagination. It met people's desire for the transcendent, the search for a bigger story to make sense of life and their place in the world. In this final episode of season one of The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, I want to conclude by using those same three lessons for those who want to lean into the possibility of a new move of God today. Firstly, that the rebirth will mean keeping Christianity weird. Secondly, that churches must create communities that counter modern cancel culture. And finally, the importance of embracing both reason and the imagination as we offer a good, beautiful and true story to those searching for meaning, purpose and identity in the world today. I'm Justin Briley, and throughout my working life, I've been hosting conversations on faith between atheists, agnostics and believers. In this documentary series, I'm telling the story of why new atheism grew old and secular thinkers are considering Christianity again. I'm speaking to those inside and outside the atheist movement and the many new thinkers beginning a new conversation on the value of faith. Along the way, we'll meet some of those who have found themselves surprised by God as they've made the journey from atheism to Christianity. Welcome to The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, Episode 30, Surprised by God, Three Ways to Welcome the Returning Tide of Faith. Just before we get into the rest of today's show, someone we've heard from quite a bit on the podcast is author and speaker Glenn Scrivener. Hello, Glenn. Hey, Justin. Always great to be here. Well, for a while now, you've been happily pointing people to your online course 321. Where did that come from? 
It's a passion of mine to help people get to grips with Christian faith and to do it in a way that's attractive and imaginative and deep and that assumes no prior knowledge. So 321 is my way of showing life according to Jesus. We want it to be a, a, like a mere Christianity for a digital age. Okay, so that sounds like it's maybe more for those who are not Christians. Well, yeah, many people have done it who are not Christians, and they've found faith for the first time. We're thrilled about that. But like with Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, Christians love that book too. And the first audience we have in mind for 3 to 1 is actually a Christian who wants to be refreshed in their faith and to have something to pass on to their Christian curious friends and family. Okay, so Christian or not, this basically gets people to the heart of the faith. Right. And nearly 10,000 people have joined the online platform. It's free. You watch these video-led sessions and you think through the stunning animations. You engage with the chat community. You get a ton of extra content thrown in. And now you have on your phone a mere Christianity that you can share with others. So the phrase we're using is, you can share this without shame, without cost and without delay. Well, we've been really enjoying promoting 321 and listeners to this podcast can get into it instantly by going to 321course.com slash JB. That's 321course.com slash JB. Thanks, Glenn. Oh, thank you, Justin. Keep up the good work. So I went to, to Midnight Mass at Bart's that um, Christmas Eve. And at the end of the service... I looked over to where the Virgin had appeared and I thought, well, <laughs> I just will give it a go. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no, there's no atheist in a foxhole. What have I got to lose? Remember this? Historian Tom Holland joined me for a live event in London earlier this year where he candidly described a cancer diagnosis he had received over the Christmas period in 2021 and how, after a midnight mass service at St Bartholomew the Great, he prayed a desperate prayer in the church's Lady Chapel. So I went and I haven't prayed, but I went to this place where the Virgin had appeared and I gave a heartfelt prayer, you know, come on, please. And all kinds of things went right from that, that point on. And I, I won't go into the details, but basically it seemed miraculous that in the most unexpected way, I, I, I not only got access to the photos, which told me that I didn't have cancer in the lymph nodes, but also the cancer hadn't spread from the polyp. And that therefore I didn't need to have this chunk of the gut removed. And um, two years on, I, I, I seem clear of it. So I dodged a massive, massive bullet there. Um, and the perfectly rational reasons how this happened. But it was so unexpected, and I don't want to go into the details of it, but they, were, they required so many coincidences that I have been tempted to see it as miraculous. Tom says his miracle moment has accompanied an intellectual journey to bring him to the edge of a personal faith. His story also reminds me of another recent convert in this series, Tammy Peterson, who credits her own healing from a terminal cancer diagnosis to the power of prayer. So I was watching Jordan. I was seeing how much he suffered. And uh, that was heavy on my heart. I don't know. I thought if I could say something that would be comforting to him, that might be helpful. And so I just said what seemed reasonable. <laughs> I said, you know, you know, I've had surgery. The cancer is gone. I just have this leak that is keeping me in the hospital and they can't find the leak. But I think that, you know, things will be solved by the time we have our anniversary in, in August. That's what I think. Tammy says that at the last moment, a difficult operation was avoided after the internal leak was unexpectedly healed. She also believes the hand of God was at work in the timing of the events. And so they had me go back in the hospital and I took out the IV and the, you know, everything that I was attached to. And a half an hour later, I was out of the hospital and I went back to the Airbnb with my family. And uh, when I got there, we realized that it was August 19th and that was our anniversary and none of us had been paying that close attention to what, what day it was. These are remarkable stories and neither Tammy nor Tom would claim that such outcomes are the norm. They are unusual and that's why they're remarkable. Indeed, 
Many intellectually minded Christians I know tend to avoid using miracle stories as evidence for God, as of course many people don't get healed and what counts as an answer to prayer is inevitably subjective and personal. Nevertheless, these healing stories resonate with something else Tom Holland said during our London discussion. But I think that across the country as a whole, the, um, the area of growth seems to be churches that take the supernatural seriously. So it could be evangelical ones, but it could also be kind of Anglo-Catholic ones. Mm -hmm. um, it's churches that take all the stuff about angels and signs from God and miracles and everything seriously because I don't understand why anyone would be inter interested in a Christianity that isn't taking this stuff seriously. And I think the huge problem that a lot of institutional Christianity has in this country, whether it's Church of England, Catholic Church, whatever, is that um, there is a desire, whether conscious or not, on the part of many of the people responsible for it to accommodate themselves to what they feel is the ideological mainstream. And I think that there is also a sense that they, they don't 100% have the, the courage of their convictions. Whereas it's the people who are saying, the spirit speaks to me, I talk in tongues, alleluia, healings, whatever. You know, that's, that's unusual, that's unexpected. People might sit up and say, well, that really is unexpected. Or churches where you have a palpable sense of, of, of the sublime, visions of the virgin, all that kind of stuff. Again, that's weird and odd and unexpected and not the kind of thing that you would get on Radio 4. So <laughs> I, 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 I think that churches have to major on what they have to offer that everyone else doesn't. I think the problem for Christianity is that it's been too successful. Basically, everyone has accepted its essential principles. You know, you get them all. Everyone should be you know, kind to the poor and all this kind of thing. Everyone buys into that. Uh, the, the things that the church traditionally did, education, hospital, poor relief, this has all been nationalised. So what is there left for the churches to do? What there is left for the churches to do is to talk about the stuff that no one else is talking, which is all the supernatural stuff. As I have travelled and spoken to many similar voices to Tom Holland, public intellectuals who are sympathetic to the value of Christianity, I've heard similar sentiments. If you want to attract me to church then don't dumb things down. Keep Christianity weird. In a widely shared article for The Spectator, agnostic journalist Ben Sixsmith wrote, If someone has a faith worth following, I feel that their beliefs should make me uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there's nothing especially inspiring about them. Instead of making me want to become like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. Speaking on the Reenchanting podcast, Ben Sixsmith explained how, as someone who failed to embrace the faith of his parents, he has never been attracted to forms of church that try to mimic popular culture. I mean, when I was growing up in the church, my parents were always like, here's a rock band and they're Christian. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And often, not always, but often they were quite a kind of pale version of yes, some other secular some rock band. version. Of so I would think, why Coldplay, am I more yeah. likely to listen to this yeah. than anything else? Yeah. Unless you already have some kind of pro-religious mm. bent. Mm. So, yeah, if someone comes up to you and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm really like you. Like, I like the same things. I think the same things. I dress the same way. Follow me. Mm. It's like, well, why would I follow you? Because you're not giving me something extra. Mm. Which is not to say that you should be completely bizarre and just try to be as surreal and alternative yeah. as possible, mm. because there's also there's the opposite extreme where someone looks somebody looks so eccentric <laughs> that they're just going to freak everybody out. Mm. But you need to be providing something that people aren't expecting and something that they're not used to, or it's just going to seem like you know again you're an imitator rather than an inspiration. In a big conversation for Premier Unbelievable, journalist Douglas Murray told me why, as an interested agnostic who values the Christian heritage of the West, he thinks the church should keep Christianity weird. My fear is, is constantly the church is not doing what so many of us on the house side would like it to do, which is to be preaching its gospel, to be asserting its, its truths and its claims. And so when, when one sees it, falling into all of the latest tropes 
uh, one just thinks, well, that's another thing gone. It's just like absolutely everything else in the in the era. Everything in this boring, monotone, uh, um, ill thought out, and shallow um, dialectic. And I am um, so, as I say, I'm 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 a disappointed non-adherent. <laughs> This advice from agnostics outside the church about keeping Christianity weird may seem counterintuitive. Many churches have made it their mission to appear as normal and unthreatening as possible in their efforts to bring people through the doors. But many who do walk through the doors are actually looking for something completely different to their normal, everyday life. They want to be transported into another world, a different story. With this in mind, it's noticeable how many of those who have returned to church, including Tom Holland, have chosen to embrace ancient forms of worship and liturgy that major on mystery and ritual. One recent convert I spoke to in the course of this series is storyteller and mythologist Martin Shaw. Go back to episode 9 to hear just how weird his conversion was. Since coming to faith, he has found his spiritual home in the mystery and ritual of the Eastern Orthodox Church. He explained why the strangeness of the Eastern Orthodox tradition is also part of its attraction. Uh, I, I'm having to come to terms with, for example, when we read from the Bible, it's chanted. It's not mm. really read in the way that, right. that, that post-Reformation Christians are familiar with. And I like reading the Bible, you know, in my own voice, with my own twists mm. and turns. And that doesn't roll in orthodoxy, and it's not going to roll in orthodoxy, because with orthodoxy, the clue is in the name. Yes. <laughs> the clue is in the name. Uh I have a joke. How many? How many? Uh, how many Orthodox Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? <laughs> Probably no change. Uh, so yes, sometimes it's difficult because yeah. I have a kind of improvisational spirit. I do. Mm. Um, but the liturgy itself, interesting things to note about it. Effectively, it's a sung theology. So mm. we're singing rather than reading, or if we are reading, we're chanting. The The liturgy itself is a very, very slow form of dance that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And you do feel that you've moved from... Uh, here's a. It, this will sound a rather highfalutin analogy, but it's worth making because we have the time to do it. Mm. In poetry, there's many types of poetry, but there's one type called lyric, and there's one type called epic. I grew up with lyric Christianity, not epic. Mm. Now, what that means is lyric poems have a lot of I in. They have a lot of back rub in. They have a lot of I feel this. He's in my heart. Jesus is my friend. He's here. I'm tired. Please look after me. That kind of thing. It's very personable, mm. and I like it. But epic poetry pays far less attention to the I statement and lifts you out of that completely into this much bigger drama. It, classicism is, is epic poetry. And I think what I found in orthodoxy is the little I entered the big we at that moment. And that's just something about the West in general that I'm exhausted by, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of uh, addiction to the confessional almost. Yeah. Uh, so actually for me... It, it it regulates my ego. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in orthodoxy is a real distinction between they, what they call passion and virtue. And the world we live in these days is pretty good at passion, you know, pretty good at desire. But virtue, to make a covenant with limits, mm -hmm. to understand what that looks like, those are the kind of things that I'm going through with orthodoxy. To, to distill it, finally, one more thing is... Although I may look like a, a reasonable human being, I'm actually really a 12th century chivalric knight. I always have been. And orthodoxy is a code. It's a way of behaving in the world. You can yeah. draw it with a line. It's not massively ambiguous all the time, but there are areas where they just say, it is a mystery. And I like that. 
I was looking around at all the churches. So you become a Christian, you think, well, what's the church then? There seem to be about a hundred of them. What's the actual real one? Where should I be going here? So I was praying a lot about that, but I was also going to churches and sitting in them and seeing what happened. This is author and poet Paul Kingsnorth, who explained why, like Martin Shaw, he found himself drawn to the mystery and ritual of the Orthodox Church following his conversion. Eventually, as I said, I went to this Orthodox monastery and that was a very powerful experience. I met a priest there and I talked to him and I just kept going and going and going. And the, there was an experience in the divine liturgy in the Orthodox Church, which I haven't had anywhere else. The Orthodox liturgy is usually at least two hours long. You stand up all the way through, right? Um, the Orthodox, say the Orthodox Easter service will start at 10 p.m. and finish at 2 a.m., no messing around with wow. the Orthodox. Sometimes people ask me the difference between Eastern and Western Christianity. I say Eastern Christians have better beards and stronger legs. Um, <laughs> that's fundamentally the difference. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's something... Ortho, Orthodox Christianity comes from the East. Uh, and and it's, it's two things have happened there. Um, firstly, it's been persecuted for much of its history by either by Islam or later by communism, which has made it very strong, paradoxically. Mm. It hasn't had very much power. Mm. And secondly, it hasn't had to deal with modernity. It didn't have a Reformation, didn't have the Enlightenment, mm. didn't have the Renaissance. So it hasn't been sort of had to hasn't been sort of hacked about by humanism, basically, <laughs> in the same way. And so, you, and it also has a much more mystical core, I think, than Western Christianity. Obviously, there's mysticism in Western Christianity too, but generally, I think it's it's ended up, especially in the Protestant countries, much more moralistic and rationalistic. And that was the sort of Christianity that I a proud came across at school I think it's a, it's a sort of a list of moral rules and obviously the moral rules matter in Christianity mm. but they're not the heart of the thing they exist for a reason and I found in the orthodox faith firstly something which hasn't been compromised and muddied around by the modern world but also something which can take you really much deeper than I've ever experienced in, in the western church and I think especially in the west since the 60s the church, all the churches, the catholic church the anglican church, all of them have tried to I don't know if they've tried to compromise with modernity, but they've tried to make the church more appealing. You know, mm. we've got to, that, that's the trendy vicars, right? And, yeah. and I don't blame them. It's a, it's a sort of rational thing to do. They think, well, everyone, no one's interested in the church anymore. Maybe if we make it, maybe if we make the hymns sound like pop songs, people mm. will come back. But they won't because they just want the pop songs. <laughs> and then the church looks weak. So weirdly enough, the more the church has tried to speak to or adapt itself to secular modernity, the more it's just seemed like a compromised thing. Mm. that doesn't have anything alternative to say. Whereas now, I think when people are looking at Christianity, they say, look, what's the alternative to the world? Which is actually what Christianity is supposed to be, right? St. Paul says, don't be conformed to this mm. world. The church is not the world. It's in the world, but it's mm. not of the world. Mm. So we're not supposed to be conformed to the world. And now that the world is becoming so awful in so many ways, people will say, well, where's the temple of God? Yeah. It's what's happening in the temple of God. And if it's the same thing as is happening in the world, if it's just activist politics or you know, pop songs or whatever, then why would you go? What, has it remained, if it's the word of God, it should remain unchanged, right? And it should mm. be strong and it should be beautiful as well. The other thing about orthodoxy is there's a great deal of beauty in it. The icons mm. and the, the incense, it's a kind of full bodily experience that really feels very powerful. So there's something in there that's, that I think we have lost in the West or given away. So should all churches embrace smells, bells, choral music and ancient liturgy in order to embrace the meaning-seeking millennials ready to give Christianity a try? Not necessarily. The other parts of the church experiencing growth are black Pentecostal churches and charismatic evangelical congregations. Dr. Carol Tomlin is a senior research fellow for the William Temple Foundation. As someone who both researches and worships in black Pentecostal churches, she says that an expectation of the supernatural is part and parcel of her theological tradition. Oh, yes. I mean, I've experienced it myself. I've had um, my own um, healing um, and my sister has had a supernatural healing. She was healed supernaturally from cancer um, and naturally heard the audible voice of God. Um, and I know people are, oh, yeah, they, but, you know, she's healed and she's with us today and she didn't need surgery. She was actually scheduled to have surgery. And the surgeon said, we can't see what we thought we could see. And, you know, she she has been healed. Um, so I think, as Tom Holland has said, I do think the more of the supernatural, not the weird stuff, 
um, not the spooky supernatural, because for me, supernatural encounters of God are also in the ordinariness of life. You know, I'm here. That's a supernatural encounter, if you like, that we've had, that I believe God has connected us in this way. So I don't think it's just about the weird and wonderful and just about miracle healings of cancer or some other life-threatening disease. Of course it's that, but it's also in the ordinariness of life. The steady growth of African, Caribbean and multicultural congregations in many parts of the UK has bucked the overall trend of church decline across the country. Carol got in touch with me after I wrote an article for The Spectator on whether the UK is experiencing signs of a coming Christian revival. I asked Carol whether, in a culture that appears to be opening up again to the spiritual, the Pentecostal churches she's part of could play a part in such a renewal. I think it has the capacity to transform the culture, I really do. And what's interesting now is that in some, um, certainly the Caribbean churches that I'm familiar with, the, they have more mixed congregants, which, um, for example, in Leeds, um, the New Testament Church of God, they've got 33 different nationalities in that church. Many of those nationalities are from black populations but they've also got a quote unquote an Indian population, an Iranian population, white British, or you know, that have converged in that particular space. Um I think there is more of a an openness because I think for many people, um and pe just people in general, there is a sense of hopelessness. You, you know, we've got the cost of living crisis. We've got political instability and turmoil. We've obviously got wars, you know, one not too far from our doorstep. I mean, life has never been certain, but it's been more uncertain. And obviously we had COVID, um, which I think has literally shaken the foundation of many people and, and is causing many people to question the meaning of life, a bit like Son King Solomon in the Bible. So I was quite encouraged when I saw your particular article about um, a move towards an embracing of Christianity, of faith. Um, so I think as the world gets darker, um, without being a, a prophet of doom and gloom, I think individuals will really question their security, question the meaning of life and I am praying and hoping and believing that will lead to more people embracing Jesus Christ spiritually. I, I do think there will be a reawakening in the UK. The resurgence of popularity in ancient liturgical worship and the growth of black Pentecostal and evangelical churches may seem strange bedfellows but I believe what unites them is that they each, in their own way, unashamedly embrace the weirdness of their expression of worship. Whether it be the symphonic music of a high mass, a passionate gospel choir, or eyes closed, hands in the air, band-led worship, they're all offering something intense and otherworldly. But the attraction of weirdness may also be accompanying a search for something normal too. Northern Ireland church leader Jamie Bambrick wrote about what he has dubbed the Normie Revival, following an unusual period of growth in his own church. It really came out of what we noticed happening in our local church context, where very suddenly, uh, towards, you know, towards the end of last year, we were maybe at about 180, 190 people on a Sunday. And then in a brief sort of two month period, we took a jump of almost 100 people, having changed absolutely nothing, uh, no marketing strategy, no new evangelism. You know, we were doing all the stuff we were doing before trying to be an effective and good church. But it got me asking some questions about who was coming along and why they were coming along. And then also pairing that with some of the big name 
conversions to Christianity or perhaps just expressing a serious interest in Christianity. Russell Brand would be among those who very recently, after that video actually, has been baptised and seems to be actually really growing in his walk with God. But there's been a number of other people as well. Uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, um, even Richard Dawkins talking positively about cultural Christianity, despite the fact he doesn't believe it. Uh, and so what, what I sort of thought, well, was who is going on this journey and what people are starting to express an interest in the faith. And I think that you can say that there is there is on the sort of far left, you could say there's a real antagonism towards Christianity. But everybody outside of that, let's say, extreme position seems to be moving in a direction of of openness and warmth in a in a in a broad sense obviously talking in general terms there seems to be that there's a bunch of people there who would consider themselves to be maybe center left centrists slightly right of center who are recognizing that in the loss of christianity and western culture we are losing something that has been very good and very positive and so they're starting to explore and ask those questions so i term those people normies it's basically not progressive activists it's kind of your average person um who has started to recognize that things have gone a bit wrong in our society broadly that there's a lot of strange stuff being promoted and they're concerned about that and they're starting to look for answers and many of them are turning towards Christianity at the very least as a source of wisdom but perhaps even as being a, a true faith which of course we believe it is um, but some, some of them are going as far as that and I think that as they start that journey we'll see more and more doing so. Whether it be interested agnostics on the edge of church, recent converts explaining what attracted them to church, or pastors like Jamie Bambrick seeing a renewed interest in church, I believe that keeping Christianity weird is actually about recovering the distinctive nature of church. A church that looks just like the culture around it will become so well camouflaged it becomes invisible. If there's a turning of the tide, then I believe those looking for a place to call home are more likely to be drawn by a church that's comfortable in its own skin and unapologetic about its truth claims. When the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, joined me, along with Paul Kingsnorth, for a big conversation on Premier Unbelievable, he spoke of why anxiety in churches often cripples evangelistic appeal. Christianity is, is not a religion, it's, it's life. And the issues around morality are not between good and evil, but between life and death. And the church is not an institution, it is the community where you, you grow in life. And all of these things, I, th I think, are crucially important when we're tempted to think of the church as you know, a struggling institution that has to get recruits um, to you know to manage its image in the world and all the rest of it. And my heart sinks a lot when I hear that language. I'm all in favour of mission, but as as Paul says, the more we do, the more we fuss, the more we struggle to to market our product. Somehow, the less it looks like life, and the more we give a, we give across, put across a message of feeling anxious. It's, I sometimes say just the difference between saying, come to church and you will, you will live. And as well the church saying, come to church because we will die without you. <laughs> We're going to disappear unless you join us, <laughs> which is not quite the message. <laughs> it's a, there's a get. sort of a, a bit of a desperation mm. to, to, to some, of, some of the ways, yeah, it can be put across. And I think that actually the church, rather than asking itself, you know, how can I get out there into the modern world and talk to people, which it's been trying to do since the 60s with largely catastrophic results, I think, uh, should be saying, uh, what's the truth of this? What's the deep root of the Christ radical Christian story? I'm just going to tell it. I'm going to tell that story and I'm going to tell it in an uncompromising way. And I think that will draw people because I think we're in a spiritual crisis. And I actually think that the essence of everything that's going on in our culture at the moment is not political or economic or technological. Those are manifestations of a, of a deep spiritual brokenness that we have and more and more people can see that and that's why you have there's such a spiritual search going on and people are ending up in all sorts of places some healthy and some not 
But that's because people can feel the brokenness at the heart of the story we're telling. And so if there's, you know, if the church can do something, it's be true to itself. If the church can do something, it is be true to itself. I love that line from Paul Kingsnorth. I've playfully titled this first tip for welcoming the turning tide, keep Christianity weird. But it's actually about keeping Christianity deadly serious. Serious about holding out something worth believing in, something different enough to take notice of, meaty enough to chew on, meaningful enough to contemplate for a lifetime. Christian thinker and evangelist Glenn Scrivener is meeting more and more seekers ready for that kind of Christianity. A guy came to our church uh, two Sundays ago for the first time, and he kind of said, look, I'm, uh, I'm feeling spiritually hungry. I realized I didn't understand anything about the Bible, so I ordered a Bible from Amazon. And I said, well, what translation did you order? And he said, well, King James, obviously. And I said, well, and where did you start reading? And he was, he looked at me like I was an idiot. It was like, well, Genesis, obviously. Like, where, where, what, what else would you do? But get an authorized version of the Bible and start with Genesis. And then it seemed like the obvious next step to him to come to church. And, and he basically said, well, I think the Bible has built the modern world. I think, you know, um, the, the waters that we swim in are particularly Christian waters. So I, I figured out I needed to understand more about Christianity. And I said, oh, the, the whole Tom Holland thing. And he said, well, what's Spider-Man got to do with this? And I, I kind of, and I love that because it goes to show that the, the historian Tom Holland and his thesis about how Christianized the West has become has such cut through that people are on the Tom Holland train without ever having heard of Tom Holland, the historian anyway. And so what, do, what does this guy need? Um, this guy had all sorts of questions about Genesis, and he wasn't put off by um, the the King James language. He wasn't put off by uh, how ancient the, the text felt to him. He wasn't put off by coming to church, actually. Um, what he did not need was um, an evangelistic event that the church could put on um, that was you know, 17 steps removed from an encounter with the scriptures. In fact, he would not want to come to the pub quiz where the evangelist gets up in, in, you know, at the end of round three and invites people to church. He wouldn't come to that. He wouldn't go to the five-a-side football tournament where some poor evangelist has to get up at halftime and, and explain about the gospel. Um, he would jump in with both feet to something that's deep and rich and old and weird and ancient and embodied and challenging. And so what I'm inviting him to is, well, here's a whole bunch of guys and we're going to go for a, a ramble with a ramble, okay? A ramble chat on a rambling walk, shoulder to shoulder, talking about life. And I think this guy is emblematic of loads of guys that I am meeting. Um, he was in his 20s, male, um, interested in going deep and interested in the scriptures because they are a little bit strange, because they are ancient, because they are not what he was expecting to encounter, and because he was beginning to see in the scriptures a kind of a wisdom for life, uh, as though the Bible is written for humans, to humanize people. And I think people are really waking up to the fact, and I hope Christians and churches are waking up to the fact that the scriptures are written for humans to humanize us. They're written for lots of other reasons, but they are not simply written to fine tune the discipleship of the super spiritual. But there is immense wisdom here for all of life. And I think this guy wanted wisdom with a new relationship that he just started. He, he wanted wisdom with difficult workplace issues. He, he wanted wisdom for how to negotiate a, a social media age. And fascinatingly, in this social media age, people are not concluding that we need up-to-date wisdom to deal with our online lives. I think people are waking up to the fact we need ancient, embodied, traditional wisdom to deal with our online lives. And so what's helping in churches is getting alongside these guys and talking about all of life through the lenses of the scriptures and not backing off from the fact that they are ancient, that they are weird, that they are strange, that they are not the way we might um, ordinarily see things, but, but diving in with both feet into the deep weird of the Bible and, and showing that after a lot of struggle, they actually bring into focus the world in profound ways.
Maybe it's time to retire the so-called seeker-sensitive movement and accept that what we offer must be more than entertainment. People are searching for something deeper that demands something of them. While there's no advantage to creating unnecessary barriers, the lesson appears to be that churches shouldn't dumb down their worship or their doctrine in order to win new converts. They should demand more, not less, of the people who come through their doors. So embrace mystery, expect the supernatural, and keep Christianity weird. I love listening to podcasts, but did you know you can read this one too? Signed copies of the Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God book are available at my website, justinbriley.com. Tom Holland, the historian, not Spider-Man, says Justin Briley has had a ringside seat for the past decade watching the great debates on religion and reports on them with learning, subtlety and grace. And who am I to argue with Tom Holland or Spider-Man? But if you appreciate this podcast and would like the book, why not just become a gold supporter via Patreon or US tax deductible giving? And as well as getting early access to new episodes, I'll send you signed copies of both my books. So for the book and to support, go to justinbriley.com or click the links with today's show. Something has changed in culture. People are willing to consider God again, even those who never thought they'd give it a chance. Atheists, agnostics and doubters are surprised to find themselves passionate Christ followers. How did that happen? The Ex-Skeptic podcast is filled with 100 stories of former skeptics sharing why they didn't believe what changed their mind, and how their lives have been transformed. Hosted by my friend Dr. Jana Harmon, these stories are for curious sceptics wanting to take a closer look at the question of God and the claims of Christianity, and they're also for Christians to learn how to better understand and engage with sceptics. Come and hear ex skeptic Stories on your favourite podcast platform or via YouTube, and be sure to explore more resources at exskeptic.org. If you enjoy this podcast, I think you'll love the X Skeptic podcast. That's xskeptic.org, where you'll hear unlikely stories of belief. I'm interested, but I don't know if you'll be drawn on this at all. You might I, I didn't get any list of like what you might not want to talk about, and that's fine if you don't want to. Obviously, the big controversy last year was that they, they took away this Humanist of the Year award. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Anything you think about uh, about that that you'd be willing to share? No, I don't think so, really. I think um, I'd like to say it's their loss, not mine. This was something none of us saw coming in the mid-2000s, in the heyday of new atheism. Its lead architect, biologist Richard Dawkins, being stripped in 2021 of his Humanist of the Year award, given him by the American Humanist Association some 25 years earlier. The honour was rescinded by the organisation following Dawkins' criticism of transgender ideology. Now, Dawkins obviously wasn't too bothered about it, but it was an intriguing example of the way cancel culture has come to dominate public life. People who were once considered darlings of the liberal establishment, J.K. Rowling comes to mind, can become pariahs when they question the prevailing orthodoxy. It happens on the political right too, of course. In a world of increasingly embittered politics, even moderate conservatives have been rounded upon as traitors, quislings and apostates. This tendency to demonise those we disagree with has reached its zenith in the age of the social media outrage mill and online witch hunts. I believe that it's part of the reason why so many people feel exhausted by our 24-hour news culture, which thrives on polarisation and clickbait controversy. Meanwhile, the graceless zealotry of those who police the new political orthodoxies only contributes to a sense of anxiety and fear for many people who are stumbling through our modern moral minefield. It was a point that came up in the big conversation between Douglas Murray and N.T. Wright. When I was young, we watched traditional morality go out of the window. It was sex in the 60s. It was uh, money in the 80s. You know, we don't need to obey the old rules. We, we're going to do it differently. We're the modern world now. And then what's happened is the invention of 
uh, and I think Douglas and I agree on this, the invention of neo-moralisms, which is what the woke ideology is really all about. And, and it reminds me sometimes of, I think it was Caligula, the Roman emperor, who might have been Nero, I'm getting this wrong, it's late at night, um, who put new laws um, up so high that nobody could read them and then um, blamed or punished people for not obeying these new laws that mm. you just invented. Mm. And that's that's very much what's going on at the moment. It's as yes. though society can't live without morality, but if you've banished all the older moralities, you've got to invent some more from the ground up. And we're doing this- it on a very... Um, very base, uh, uh, very flimsy basis. It seems. To me. It also goes back to what exactly is the project? Because there's an added cruelty, isn't there, to, this, to, to, to as it were, writing the laws in a place where they cannot be read. There's an added cruelty if you haven't even finished writing them yet, and you tell Quite. people to get with them. Quite. Um, Quite. So the, the, the one of the questions underneath the R era is: is what exactly are the laws? What are the rules here? Uh, the Christian yeah. ethic has uh, a, a set of rules. It's, it's, they can be debated around endlessly, as everyone present yes. knows. But, but, but that there are foundations that you cannot deny. They're not wholly abstract. I believe the church can offer a better way forward than the often puritanical and unforgiving religiosity that's driving the culture wars. It's why I believe if the church is going to welcome the turning of the tide, it must create a community that looks, feels and smells different. A community that counters cancel culture. In fact, the social benefits of adherence to a religious community are long-established facts. Research shows that people who regularly attend church report stronger social support networks and less depression. They smoke less, have happier marriages and lead healthier and longer lives than people who don't go to church. Actively religious people are proven to give both more money and more time to charities, including secular ones, the non-religious people. They even donate more blood. And it's really clear, groups that are religious are more cohesive, they have more trust, they can do more. This is popular author Jonathan Haidt telling Elizabeth Oldfield why, as a liberal atheist psychologist, he came to reevaluate his views about religion early on in his career. And at the same time, in my work on moral psychology, I was studying conservative liberal differences. And when I was actually reading the writings of intelligent, you know, the, the best conservative writing, I was like, wow, this, I had never encountered these ideas. This is actually right. Like this, from a social science point of view, you know, family and tradition and structure and authority and constraint, like, wow, people really need these things. Um, and this kind of society that progressives push for actually tends to fall apart. So a bunch of things converged. Oh, and then the third thread was writing the happiness hypothesis mm-hmm. and really reading the religious tradition, reading like every piece of wisdom literature I could find, East and West, um, and categorizing and organizing it and realizing like, yeah, there really is an accumulated body of wisdom that comes largely from the religious traditions. Um, although many modern secular people have come to the same view, but, but just to see that, that r- religious religions that have evolved over time, that's the key thing. Hmm. Religions that have evolved over time tend to, tend to evolve culturally to create ordered and not always humane societies, but usually, and especially in America, where religions had to compete with each other for mm-hmm. converts, they have to be really nice. Whereas there are other parts of the world where it's not like that and religions mm-hmm. can be much more much more brutal. Um, yeah. So I don't want to defend religion everywhere, but at least yeah. in, in America where we have a free market, religions actually really do make people nice on average. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's any coincidence that Christianity produces the physical and mental benefits outlined by Haidt, given it's based on the spiritual and moral example of Jesus. But here's Elizabeth Oldfield speaking on the Reenchanting podcast with a helpful reminder of why Jesus' example also challenges the pharisaical culture of our age. But one of our tendencies we need to resist is our overarching preference for people like me. And... The way I have learned to do that is through the ministry of Jesus. Uh, Like, to speak very starkly, I think you can make a very strong argument that polarization, tribalism, groupishness, in-groupishness are are sin and one of the primary sins that I see in scripture. Mm. You see Jesus being someone who 
repeatedly, mischievously, relentlessly crosses divides. <laughs> He'll be like, who is going to drive everyone mad if I go sit with them? Purity codes, in and out groups, yeah. who will be seen with who? He's just like, turn it all upside down, create chaos. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. it about him. It's just like, <laughs> walk away. Um, just, just not letting people get away with, but of course not them. Mm. I won't mm. be seen with them. The gospel isn't for them. Mm. I'm not called, they're not my neighbor. I'm not called to love them. That's just like, it's, it's, it, it's, it's so deep in us, the temptation. And the scripture again is like, it's bracing medicine for that. Mm. And then there's some very, very concrete things that he says, which is love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I could spend my whole life. If it was just that, if that was the one command of my tradition, I could spend my whole life trying to live that and still not get there. And we at least had a culture that in theory knew that we were supposed to love our enemies and we were supposed to not rule anyone out based on their position or their group or their past or if they hated us, right? We don't, we don't get to hate them back if they hate us. That's not part of this walk. That's not part of this path. What we have now, I think, is the inverse of that, which is righteousness is 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 attack. Righteousness is policing. Righteousness mm. is being the pure ones against the, those unrighteous others who we will cast from the tent. And I see this as clearly on the right as on the left. <laughs> I see this everywhere. But that, that actual horrible, like two-headed mutant thing that's happened with morality, mm. which is to be a good person, you must exclude people. Mm -hmm. You must stay pure and resist the company people not like you, it's just a completely demonic lie. Joe Frost, author of Being Human, believes that the church has a message that is more relevant than ever for those who find themselves burned out by the demands of modern life. You'd only have to walk into a bookshop or open Amazon to see what the bestsellers are, to know that self-help is still a massive um, a pull people are asking questions about reinvention about who they are and how they are to live the mental health crisis would imply that people are are really struggling in their lives and what what's happening around them um and we were what was it uh 22 word of the year perma crisis this idea that we are lurching from crisis to crisis to crisis and we're living in a perpetual state of fear anxiety Somebody came along and said, we don't have to live like this, you know. There is a different way of being. And even in the small, even in the little, to demonstrate a different way of life, a different formation, a different narrative, I'm encountering time and time again. People are incredibly open to that. They're surprised when my answer is Jesus is that story. They didn't expect that. They assumed that there is something new or ancient or other. Um, but actually, time and time again, people are going, well, maybe, what have I got to lose? And uh, and that is the moment where you go, actually, a friend of mine was giving her testimony in church this week, and she said, it turned out I had a lot to lose. I had hopelessness to lose fear to lose, anxiety to lose, depression to lose. There was so much that I had to lose when I gave my life to Jesus and I don't miss any of it. And I just think actually that's really powerful. As the West becomes ever more consumeristic and individualistic, the opportunities to be part of a genuine community are constantly diminishing. As populations have become more mobile, we've lost our rootedness in a place. We no longer know who our neighbours are. We've created structures that enable us to live independently from each other. We interact with our devices more than real people these days. It's leading to a loneliness epidemic in our culture and a mental health crisis in turn. But Joe Frost says the church still exists as one of the few places for face-to-face -face community where we can explore the ups and downs of life with others. We can lose sight of the beauty of the church, that this we are the bride of Christ adorned in splendor because we still see through a glass dimly all the bits that we fail at. But day in, day out, in communities, down our streets, in our places, 
we see the church serving our community and bringing the kingdom manifest in people's lives. We saw it in COVID. Church workers were key workers. It was the church that fed, not exclusively, but time and time again, we put our values, we put our story into practice and we saw life um, and we saw the power of Jesus break into people. And I think we can never lose faith in the church we can recognize our fallibilities and we can give ourselves over again to say, Jesus, have your way with us. Transform us again by your spirit. Sanctify us, justify us, bring us back by your grace. Forgive us for the bits that we get wrong, but Lord, help us be your church because the church is the humanity. It is the coming of Christ manifest in our communities and it's a beautiful thing. In the end, the benefits of being part of a worshipping community are about more than just physical and mental health. I believe we are made to be people who live and laugh together, sometimes anger and annoy each other, but who learn to love our neighbour in the process. That is both the great challenge and gift of the church. Elizabeth Oldfield herself has taken that a step further than many by becoming part of a small religious community with her family, covenanting to live life together. I asked her what the Christian curious seeker who may be considering church can do to take their own step towards being part of something bigger than themselves. I think it will be different for everyone, but deciding to commit is a big part. Because when we go approaching these rhythms or these rituals or these communities that we have become convinced of what we need to form us, Mm. help us stay loyal to our values, Very often it's like, I'll just dip my toe in the water. I'll give it a few weeks. Or no, that person was really annoying. (laughs) You know, off I go. I think it's why marriage is so transformative, right? Mm -hmm. You lock yourself in so that when you hit that, this person's really annoying bit, (laughs) you're in. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying everyone should, should, you know, go and make vows to be part of a monastery or irrevocably sign themselves up Mm -hmm. to be part of a community. But assuming that things are going to take a long time and building that in, at the beginning, you know, saying I'm going to join this community and I'm going to give it a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if at the end of the year, I'm still like, I don't think this is forming me in the direction that I want to be defining my life. This doesn't feel like it's helping me stay loyal to my values. Then ask that question, but don't go for two or three weeks and then Mm -hmm. decide not, Mm -hmm. you know, and for us, you know, we spent, we spent one night a week for a year with these friends talking and praying and thinking and reading and going to visit other communities. And then we rented together for 18 months and then we're like, yeah, this is this the, living with each other is going to help us become more fully alive, become more the kind of people that we want to be, become make it more likely that when we die, which happens to all of us, we will be able to look back and say, I did not spend my life distracted by nonsense. I spent it trying to grow in faith and hope and love. So we didn't just jump in madly into like really quite a significant financial commitment with another family, but we did decide. And I think that is a very countercultural thing to be the person who, who, who is championing commitment and saying, what can we actually manage here? What can we promise each other? And, and say that we're not going to flake randomly. Mm. We're going to take this seriously. This is part, this is our life. This is our life. You know, this is our time. What does, what is the scaffolding that my future self needs when I'm tired and distracted and grumpy? How can I give her the best possible chance of making the decisions that are towards fully aliveness and not towards disconnection. And I'm all about like set myself up for success. I asked Glenn Scrivener for his suggestions for what church leaders can do to embrace meaning seekers washed in by the turning of the tide. His advice was disarmingly simple. Noticing that what we already have is just so valuable, like the very idea that we can meet together, even if it's just once a week, even if it's just on a Sunday morning and share coffee or tea afterwards and and have that kind of catch up. We've had a shared experience of shoulder to shoulder worshiping God and, you know, singing to one another and hearing this ancient wisdom and praying together in this embodied way. And having that touch point, even if it's just once a week, um, I, I do think church um, 
at its best calls forth from us um, something more than just uh, uh, an hour on a Sunday, but even just an hour on a Sunday is an incredible blessing. I, I got to talk to Ayan Hirsi Ali just, just yesterday, who has come out of Islam first and then the new atheism. And she was describing to me how she learns a little more Sunday by Sunday. And, and she, she talked me through um, what church looked like for, for somebody who had absolutely no experience of it. But um, she loved the fact that they got down on their knees to, to, to pray, loved the fact that we were singing these hymns together. And love the fact that we're, ha- we're having, you know, coffee and tea afterwards and, and sharing life with a cross-section of people you would not encounter anywhere else except perhaps the supermarket Tesco's, right? <laughs> uh, where else do you get a cross-section of, of generations, of classes, of ethnicities? Where else do you get that kind of and, – and just the fact of embodied meeting together – that's already a huge win that churches have. But then, yes, if you want to do intentional discipleship with uh, young guys, especially who are showing up, then I, I would recommend what we used to do and call it men's ministry. That is kind of now our evangelism. And you don't have to tweak it very much. Um, and you don't have to add a whole lot of bells and whistles and, and, and add a whole lot of gimmicks to it. What you just need to do is is gather together and get real with one another and have a number of Christians who are perhaps longer in the tooth, who've been around the block a few times, who uh, have followed Jesus and, and can share the, the deep, rich, weird wisdom of the scriptures with one another. I, I think that's where discipleship is really happening. But it's also where evangelism is really happening, because I, I really think that distinction between evangelism and discipleship is fortunately being loosened. Because I think we're recognizing that discipleship is just evangelizing Christians and, and evangelism is just discipling non-Christians. <laughs> and, and I think we're in a very healthy moment when the wall between evangelism and, and discipleship is starting to break down. As those emerging from the meaning crisis seek to make sense of themselves and their part in a bigger story... I believe churches need to be places of capacious community. We need to be ready to embrace the walking wounded and make space for those at the beginning of their journey. That means being places where people can ask awkward questions without being shouted down. Places where we take seriously the experiences and stories of people who are different from each other. Places where people with different views on a whole range of social and ethical issues can hope to find something to unite them that's bigger than their differences. We need to create communities that counter cancel culture and offer life in all its fullness. I don't like anything here at all said Frodo, step or stone, breath or bone. Earth, air and water all seem accursed, but so our path is laid. Yes, that's so, said Sam, and we shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it before we started. This is a moving passage from the audiobook of The Lord of the Rings, narrated by Andy Serkis. But I I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr Frodo, adventures, as I used to call them, I used to think that they were things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for because they wanted them, because they were exciting and life was a bit dull. A kind of a sport, as you might say. But that's not the way of it with the tales that really mattered or the ones that stay in the mind. Folks seem to have been just landed in them, usually. Their parts were laid that way, as you put it. But I expect they had lots of chances, like us, of turning back, only they didn't. And if they had, we shouldn't know. Because they'd have been forgotten. We hear about those as just went on, and not all to a good end, mind you. At least, not to what folk inside a story and not outside it call a good end. You know, 
coming home and finding things all right, though not quite the same, like old Mr Bilbo. But those aren't always the best tales to hear, though they may be the best tales to get landed in. I wonder what sort of a tale we've fallen into. I wonder, said Frodo, but I don't know. J.R.R. Tolkien's classics of fantasy literature, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, continue to draw new audiences many decades after they were first published. The Lord of the Rings, in particular, represents the quintessential hero's journey, as Frodo, with the help of his friends, is tasked with taking the Ring of Power to be destroyed in the fires of Mount Doom. There's no doubt Tolkien saw himself in a long line of those who have used fiction and imagination to engage the real world of good, evil, triumph and tragedy. Tolkien, a devout Catholic, never used his fantasy world for explicitly evangelistic purposes. But as Tolkien scholar Holly Ordway told me, he had a Christian faith that was deeply integrated with his love of literature and life, and his Christian worldview is clearly present throughout the narrative in his stories. P.S. If you've never read or watched The Lord of the Rings, there are some spoilers coming up. This is the kind of thing that I think really does reflect Tolkien's faith, not anything on the surface, but deep-seated things like like the value of of humility, the fact mm. that the the meek will inherit the earth, you know, that the the small people, the the humble hobbits, because it's not it's not Aragorn the warrior, it's not Gandalf the wise who are able to complete the quest. Mm. It's Frodo and Sam, mm. and in fact, Frodo fails. Mm. Frodo fails, mm. um, and it's only through the fact that he had had pity on Gollum that Gollum is there to seize the ring. Mm. So again, he's he's emphasizing littleness, weakness, humility, pity, mercy. Um, these are the important elements that allow the quest to be fulfilled, mm. not through power or wisdom, mm. um, but through littleness. Um, and that's found the Christian and certainly not something that you find, you know, in the heroic sagas. Yeah. Um, mm. It's really mm. coming from Tolkien's faith. Holly Ordway is the author of Tolkien's Faith, a spiritual biography. Speaking to myself and Belle Tyndall on the Reenchanting podcast, she explained how the genius of Tolkien's storytelling reflected the storyline of many other great sagas that ultimately find their home in the story of Christ. Tolkien himself wrote about it in an essay titled On Fairy Stories. It's very interesting, this bit of his essay. It's the most explicitly apologetics thing mm -hmm. that Tolkien ever wrote. He was very, didn't do this sort of thing very often. Mm -hmm. But in it, he talks about the joy of the happy ending and how he calls this you catastrophe, the good catastrophe. And he says that um, the Gospels are a fairy story with the best you know, you catastrophe possible. But this fairy story happened in history. Mm -hmm. And the incarnation, he says, is the eucatastrophe of human history. Mm -hmm. And the resurrection, he says, is the eucatastrophe of the incarnation. Right. And so he says that in his, in his understanding of it, um, that when we experience the joy of a happy ending in a, in a fantasy story, in, in any story, mm -hmm. we are, in effect, participating in the joy of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Because that is the glimpse of evangelium, he says. Yeah. And the really fantastic thing is that he's saying this is how the happy ending simply works. Mm. Because the resurrection happened and it is a cosmic event. It happened whether you acknowledge that it happened or not. Mm. So if you as a reader, not a Christian, rejoice in a happy ending... You are, in fact, participating in the joy of the resurrection without knowing it. Mm. Um, and, and so for Tolkien, that's one of the most fundamentally Christian things about the Lord of the Rings yeah. is that we have this you catastrophic ending we, through sorrow and pain mm. and at a great cost mm. and this profound happy ending. And 
So in that sense, the thing that is most Christian for Tolkien, the participation in the resurrection of Christ, is also the point at which it can resonate with every human being, mm -hmm. um, whether they're a diehard atheist yeah. or a Christian. And I think that helps to explain something of its universal appeal while also being fundamentally Christian. Tolkien was a master storyteller. If we are to meet those searching for meaning and purpose in the wake of the meaning crisis, I believe the church needs to begin telling its story afresh as an adventure of the heart and mind with an appeal to both reason and the imagination. In this final part of today's show, I want to draw on both Tolkien and his great contemporary and friend C.S. Lewis and the power of storytelling. Famously, Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, was an atheist until his early 30s. He was a brilliant Oxford academic, but as he came under the influence of Christian thinkers and realised that his beliefs in justice, beauty and meaning must have a transcendent source, he began to doubt his atheism. However, Lewis's conversion between 1929 and 1931 was a two-stage affair, firstly to belief in God and then to Christianity. Lewis was a scholar of ancient and medieval literature. He knew all the stories of dying and rising gods and assumed that the story of Christ was one more such story, until a conversation with his friend and fellow Oxford Don J.R.R. Tolkien while walking around the meadow behind Magdalen College changed his mind, a scene captured in the film The Most Reluctant Convert. As we talked, I said, Follows, I have, with considerable resistance, come to believe in God, but not Christianity. No, Jack. I cannot believe something I do not understand. How can the life and death of someone else, whoever he was, 2,000 years ago, help us in the here and now. When you meet a god sacrificing himself in a pagan story like Dionysus, Balder, Osiris, or even in a fairy tale, you like it very much and are mysteriously moved by it, provided you meet it anywhere except in the Gospels. Well, the story of Christ is a myth, working on us in the same way as other myths, with one tremendous difference in that it really happened. Suddenly, a rush of wind interrupted us, startling me. So many leaves fell to the ground, I thought it was raining. I held my breath. Come on, Jack, you're too slow to catch a cold. You know Dyson ain't sitting on those steps waiting to be let in. I don't know if Tollers remembered that moment. I did. His words hit home. No matter how unwilling, I was beginning to move. He became a Christian in large part uh, because of the influence of Tolkien and another friend called Hugo Dyson. This is C.S. Lewis scholar Michael Ward. Um, who encouraged Lewis to engage with Christianity more imaginatively, more narratively and symbolically and and not just uh, in other words uh, to to engage with christianity as as the true myth that was the important mm. phrase mm. um christianity has a sort of a mythic dimension to it which which chimes with pagan myths that lewis had grown up loving and finding very profound and suggestive dying and rising god stories um but with christianity lewis sort of set aside his imaginative and sort of dramatic engagement with Christianity and, and sort of just dried it out, desiccated it, translated it into doctrines and into concepts, okay. into a sort of theological mm. framework and left the story in the dust, as it were. Mm. But Tolkien and Dyson said, well, principally, Christianity is a story. Before it's a theological framework or a mm. system of thought, it's a drama. A, a, yes. In this case, a real, a historical drama. Mm -hmm. a, a real man in a real time, in a real place, doing real things in the way that, you know, the pagan gods, nobody ever believes they were historical personages. But Christianity is well documented historically. Um, yet it becomes a fact historically without ceasing to be a drama. It's the true myth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when Lewis saw it in those terms, um, 
he, it was a great sort of obstacle, a hurdle overcome. And a week or so after that conversation with Tolkien and Dyson, he said, I've, I've passed over from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ. Lewis's own journey is itself an example of something I believe the church needs to capture. Lewis's first move from atheism to belief in God was largely an intellectual journey of reason and logic. For many years, especially when responding to the new atheism, I too was involved in traditional apologetics, making an intellectual case for faith from evidence and reason. But Lewis's second move from theism to a living Christian faith was something different, an imaginative journey, coming to see that in the end, the poetic and fantasy world of beauty, love, good and evil that fired his imagination and that the sagas and stories he loved from pagan mythology of dying and rising gods were actually all pointing to the true myth. Seeing that all stories point towards the great story of Jesus was what brought Lewis to faith in Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. Apologetics, evidence and reason is something I still cherish. But I think the church now needs to move on from those years of tangling with the new atheists on their own rationalistic terms and embrace storytelling and the imagination again. Because that's ultimately what moves people towards faith. In many ways, I can't improve on the way Elizabeth Oldfield expressed it in our conversation at the Unheard Club in London. The idea that Christians or atheists or anyone in between is going, right, what makes, where's the logic here? Let me just plot this on a spreadsheet. Okay, that's where I'm going to, that's the path I'm going to use to lead my life. And Christians, (laughs) I think, Mm. bought that lie for a while and decided if we can just, if we can just meet these arguments, if we can just come up with a cosmology, if we can just make this neat and tidy and palatable for this very thin narrow definition of reason, then we'll be able to persuade persuade people. There are possibly some people whose formation means they think in maths, essentially, who might need that. Most of us don't. People who have had a broad attention to the world, who are, I think, trying to live wisely and deeply, know that our decisions are made and these deepest decisions about who to love, these things that define our lives, the things that we say at our funerals are are existential and emotional and embodied and relational. And so the sort of new nonsense, new atheist moment, and I include some Christians in that, has ebbed. And what you're left with is is the truer thing, that we as humans, actually, most of us long for unconditional love. And we long for, we long to be seen, and we long to be known, and we long for a deep intimacy, and we long for our lives to mean something, Mm. and we long to be part of a story bigger than ourselves. I think Elizabeth Oldfield nailed it there. We long to be seen, we long to be known, we long for our lives to mean something, and we long to be part of a story bigger than ourselves. Psychologists tell us that we are story-driven creatures. We cannot make sense of our lives without believing there's some kind of guiding narrative to them. And as we've explored on previous episodes, there's an increasing longing bubbling up in our culture, a longing to be part of a bigger story. Martin Shaw, a storyteller and mythologist by background, knows more than most about the power of story and says his own adult conversion to Christianity is being reflected in the search for more among a younger generation and some influential figures in popular culture. An interesting little development is that as the as the father of a teenage daughter, as a, as the, the father of a little digital native, mm. For the first time, I'm noticing more ambivalence for young people around technology mm. than the ones that are slightly older. Right. It's as if they are, are, they're so used to it now, they can actually identify, rather than being this sort of horrific idea that we're getting sort of brought endlessly into the sort of the frame of a computer where we're sort of AI beings they seem still to have discernment. They still seem to have a sense of things of va- things that value and matter that you can't find on a screen. So that's a mm. hopeful thing. Someone else who's going through, you know, a very deep public conversation around faith is Nick Cave. Yes. There's no one, no one in modern <laughs> music more credible than him. 
other than maybe mm. Dylan. Uh, he, he, it's extraordinary, these conversations he's had with Rowan Williams and others. Um, I agree, the God-shaped hole, the meaning-shaped hole, for me, the myth-shaped hole, is not going to go away. Nick Cave, the musician mentioned by Shaw, has gained something of a cult following over decades of creating brooding, intense and often religiously inspired rock music with his band The Bad Seeds. When I read Cave's memoir, Faith, Hope and Carnage, I was very moved by its searingly raw account of love, loss and profound grief following the tragic death of his teenage son Arthur. The book also details the comfort Cave has drawn from sitting in ancient churches, coming back to prayer, contemplation and often finding God waiting in the silence. At the time of the book's publication in 2022, Cave spoke to the BBC's Kirsty Walk about his newfound journey with faith, his continuing struggle with scepticism and why he started to attend church. You know, I, I think religion asks something of us. It asks something of us. And spirituality is a little bit more amorphous and we can all be spiritual and we are all spiritual and like, well, of course we are all spiritual. Um, but religion requires is sp spiritu spirituality with rigor, let's say. It requires something of us. And that action, um, I think, is what it's probably all about. So what does being religious require of you? For me, I'm more um, inclined to do religious things like go to church, uh, pray, um, read scripture. I mean, I've always done these things anyway. Um, actually, even in, at, in my most chaotic times, I've done those sorts of things. But I feel uh, that, that when I walk when I read scripture or when I walk out of church or this, sort of, I, I feel less, I, I feel my skepticism is a little less. And I, it's I more distant. Little, it's a little more it distant. Who it be? Yeah. And is there a... But that struggle, the yeah. struggle is very much where I am and, and, and in regard to religion and the ideas of God and, and Christian ideas. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle. I mean, by no means arrived anywhere on that kind of thing. Do you think that Arthur's death strengthened your faith? Yeah, I, I think a lot of things happened. I think the writing of the book, weirdly enough, did that. Um, the book itself starts uh, with, with a, a kind of nervousness around questions of faith and ends it ends more firm about those sorts of things. Now that's, when I talk about, when we're talking about faith here, I'm also talking about doubt. You know, these two things for me uh, go hand in hand and, and you know, a, a deep ingrained skepticism I have towards these sorts of things. And the faith that I feel is that occasional uh, journeying away from that skepticism into something else. Um, and I, I find that really a powerful um, place to be, especially uh, imaginatively and creatively. In the book, um, you say that religion can be um, a shepherding force that holds communities together. There is an argument to say that religion is not always a force for good. That's very true, and it's, there's many arguments why religion is, is not a force for good. But when I walk into a, a, a Christian church, I walk into something that I feel I belong to. It's my thing. It's something that um, I was raised in as a child. There's a sense of nostalgia, a sense of safety about that. I, I don't step into that and deny anyone else their religious beliefs or whatever. It just feels like it's my place. Um, and I don't say that in any um, divisive or like nationalistic way or, or anything like that. I mean, I just never connected to Eastern religion, let's say, you know, that, that was too, too spiritual in a sense. So I, I never found the language, the aesthetic, anything about it particularly compelling for me personally. Um, and I, I always found something in the figure of Christ 
that was deeply compelling to me. Um, it always was, even as a child. I don't believe in an interventionist God. But I know, darling, that you do. A song into my arms. I don't believe in an interventionist God. And you have also, as you say, changed your idea about faith and doubt. I mean, I mean that particular song. If we, you know that particular song to me, feels like a person on the point of conversion. I think that's what that song's saying. Well, not to touch a hair in your head, leave you as you are. He felt he had to direct you and direct you into my own. But it's a it's a good serviceable song because it it you know well it, it services the atheist and the believer and and pretty much everyone can kind of play that at a wedding or a funeral or whatever it's it's done me very well that song because <laughs> it's kind of a broad church shall we say and a lot and everyone can collect within that song but for for me it's essentially a religious song. And, and it's that I don't believe in God. It's that I don't believe in an interventionist God. Into my arms, oh Lord, into my arms. Nick Cave is currently touring with his new album, Wild God, bringing his curious, questioning take on faith to audiences across the world. For me, he's yet another example of a poet, a storyteller, who has suddenly, in this rebirth moment, opened up to the greatest story. Like Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, both of whom could turn their hand to extraordinary storytelling and some pretty decent poetry too, there seems to be a fresh openness to the power of the story that has shaped us. Lewis's later life again provides an instructive example of the power of reason versus imagination. Soon after his conversion, he began to use his prodigious mind to write books on the intellectual case for faith. Mere Christianity, the problem of pain and miracles are all classics in their genre. However, later in life, he swapped this apologetic output in favour of fiction, most famously his best-selling children's fantasy novels, The Chronicles of Narnia. So had Lewis given up on making the case for Christianity? Far from it. Many more people have been drawn into the Christian worldview through Narnia than via the logic of the moral argument in mere Christianity or his critique of materialism in miracles, as masterful as they are. Speaking on the Reenchanting podcast, Michael Ward explained that Lewis himself became acquainted with the limits of reason to persuade people towards faith. There's a famous episode in Lewis's Oxford life when he was apparently brought down a peg or two by the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, who, during a debate at the Socratic Club founded by Lewis himself, she pointed out a flaw in the argument of his book Miracles, one of Lewis's most philosophical books defending the existence of God. And it became this sort of urban myth. Did you see Lewis trounced at the <laughs> Socratic Club last night wow. by this young woman? Um, and so people like A.N. Wilson and um, others have said, oh, Lewis was so shocked by this debate in, in philosophy that he retreated into fantasy. Right. He couldn't <laughs> hack it as Licking a... his wounds. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, he couldn't hack it as a real <laughs> rational thinker. So <laughs> what's, what's next? Fairy tale. <laughs> Which is absurd. Yeah. Um, and I think, actually, his turn to the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe was his own attempt to retell in sort of imaginative and dramatic and symbolic form the argument that he had been making in Miracles, which Elizabeth Anscombe had, had um, you know, said needed tightening up. Because Lewis was, above all things, a poet. At least that's how he conceived of himself. He said, you know, from the age of 16 onwards, I had this burning ambition to be a poet. And indeed, the first two books he ever published were books of poetry. But he never succeeded in writing verse that either sold well or was critically esteemed. Nonetheless, he did have poetic gifts. He understood language, he understood symbol and metaphor, and he trans transferred those gifts from his verse into his prose. 
And his sideline as a as a sort of philosopher or, or, or apologist was was really just that a sideline. He he was fundamentally, um, foundationally, he said, an imaginative man, mm. and the imaginative side in him was was older and more continuously operative <laughs> than the argumentative side. So the argument in miracles was was worth doing, but when Elizabeth Anscombe pointed out a little wrinkle in it, which Lewis accepted and later rewrote the offending chapter to take into account her criticisms. But when he realized there was a wrinkle, I think he said to himself, well, how can I retell this argument to myself mm. and eventually to my readers, symbolically, narratively, dramatically? And the lion, the witch, and the water, I think, was the answer to that mm. question. And to that extent, Lewis believed you could receive truth through storytelling yeah. um, and that that shouldn't be sort of put in a completely different camp to yes. the philosophy Which that he also loved. brings you know? us back to yeah. your initial question about his conversion yeah. and the true myth that he finally realised yes. was the best way of understanding Christianity. It was not best understood by translating it into doctrines and concepts, however important those may be, because those are secondary, those are ancillary modes of discourse. They have their place, um, but they're not, they're not the language that is most adequate to the thing being described. And indeed, that's a very important phrase that Lewis uses. He says Christian, the, the, the mythic, or the narrative, the dramatic way of understanding Christianity is the language more adequate than any other. Mm. Mm. You can translate the narrative of Christianity, the story, into a system of thought, into theological concepts and creedal statements and all those important things that theologians like to do. But you're translating from a richer language into a poorer language in so doing. You're making things more precise. So that's why you tend to do it, because it enables you to speak more clearly, you know, less equivocally. But in other respects, you're, you're trading down, mm. um, which is why Christianity is best understood as a story, a true story. Mm. It's imaginative, yes, and rational. But we tend to think, we, we tend to fall into this trap yes. of saying one is imaginative, one is rational. So why am I drawing on the example of C.S. Lewis, who died more than 60 years ago? Well, I believe he offers a powerful example of how we can help people realise through imaginative use of storytelling, art, literature and music that they really want the story of Christianity to be true. We need to appeal to the imagination again. The problem with the word imagination is that we assume it to be the equivalent of fantasy, fairy tale or fiction. But in fact, imagination is where we most frequently encounter the kind of truth that really matters. The blockbuster box office superhero films and the best-selling fictional worlds of witches and wizards all involve epic battles of good versus evil. We're moved by stories of heroism. The theme of sacrifice for a greater cause runs through all our art and literature. The books we read, the songs we listen to, and the pictures we hang on our walls are usually about things we can't touch, smell, or taste. Beauty, justice, and love. All of these, in my view, are echoes of the Christian story. As shocking as it may sound from someone whose day job is in apologetics, these stories remind us that the most fruitful way we can introduce people to the Christian story is through the realm of the imagination rather than just the intellect. We do that by making people want Christianity to be true in the first place, by showing how it meets our deepest instincts about what matters most. Only then can traditional apologetics, the work of showing them why it is true, be of any use. What Lewis did most brilliantly in his stories was to make his readers wish that Narnia really existed. How many children and maybe even a few adults have checked the back of a wardrobe in hopes it might just lead to a magical land of castles, fawns and talking beasts? However, in making them hope that Narnia's tales of heroism, love, sacrifice and redemption were true, Lewis gave readers the imaginative permission to see that maybe, just maybe, the story could be true in the real world. For of course, Lewis had transposed the story of Jesus into the world of Narnia and its Christ character, Aslan. 
I asked Holly Ordway for her advice to those who want to appeal to the imagination today in the sublime way that Lewis and particularly Tolkien did in their generation. There are two two aspects of my answer. Um, mm. The more straightforward one is, well, we can encourage people to both read and to, and to write stories that are simply good stories that participate in this kind of joy, this kind of meaningfulness, um, and encourage people not to scoff at a happy ending, yeah. you know, that we, yes, stories that allow us to have recovery, um, you know, that, that escape, allowing us to see visions of the world, that, you know, that we would like to live in. Mm. I mean, in this day and age, that would include just stories that present, for instance, marriage and family life as something that's beautiful, mm. difficult, but beautiful and possible. Mm. Mm. How many people today don't even, I mean, coming from broken homes, how many people need a vision of what it is like to simply be married and stay married and have that be a good thing? Mm. I mean, that would be a great gift mm. to, to the, to the water world, those kinds of stories, you know, people need to see it in order to desire it, to imagine it and desire it. That's the easy answer. The harder answer, I think, or the more challenging answer, I think comes back to what we've been talking about, about his faith being integrated. Yeah. Um, because the reason he could write The Lord of the Rings is twofold. One is that he was a, a genius um, and yeah. brilliant writer, like the likes of which, you know, he, I honestly think he's up there with, you know, Shakespeare and, and Chaucer and, and he will go into the, the canon, yeah. you know, in 400 years, you know, He's going to be right up there. Mm. So that we can't even hope to reproduce that. We should just allow him to be the genius that he is. Mm -hmm. But the other part that allowed him to write the Lord of the Rings is that he was a very sincere Christian who had an integrated life, who, who strove to live out his faith, even though he found it very difficult, sometimes very dry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is something that each of us can do. So I, I take from his life, you know, a, a call to personal holiness to say, mm -hmm. you know, I'm an academic like Tolkien. How can I, you know, be Christ-like in serving my students, in serving, you know, my colleagues? Golly, that, you know, that, that's a mission field right there just to, to do yeah. that well. Yeah. For each of us, you know, how are we called to live out our faith where we are, which mm -hmm. is what Tolkien did. He lived on his faith as an academic and as a fiction writer and as a friend and as a parent and as a spouse. Um, so I think that if we can individually, each of us, really be totally grounded in Christ, we will be better witnesses. We will re-enchant the world simply by our presence. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, this is hard, <laughs> uh, but worth it. As we conclude today's show, thinking about how we can tell the Christian story of reality more imaginatively to a world looking for transcendence and re-enchantment again, to people looking for a meaningful adventure in life, Holly Ordway's own story of coming to faith in adult life while teaching English literature at university is very instructive. You see, Holly was brought up in a secular home without any Christian input, but her life was lived among books, especially fantasy fiction. In many ways, I think your, your early life was quite impacted by Lewis and Tolkien. You were a huge fan of fantasy literature. Tell, tell us what drew you to the worlds of The Lord of the Rings and Narnia and so on. Well, it's interesting because I, I really don't remember a time when I didn't know Middle Earth and Narnia. Um, I mean, literally, I've racked my brains to try and think, when did I first read these? And I think it was The Hobbit and, and the Chronicles of Narnia, probably somewhere around age eight. Um, that's mm -hmm. the best I can figure. But they've always been part of that sort of imaginative world. Um, I was an absolute bookworm as a girl. That has not changed. <laughs> um, and loved fantasy, loved those imaginative worlds, and just found their visions to be just compelling and beautiful and mm. engaging. And I think the fact that they're also so beautifully written, it's not, it's not just that they have a fantastic story and characters. It's that just the very language of it is so beautiful. And I, you know, maybe that helped nudge mm. me mm. in the literary direction too. What you've spoken about and written about as well is, is the way in which you were raised in a non-religious setting and in a curious way, I'd love to just sketch that out briefly, that journey into literature and poetry 
was quite formative in you eventually coming to Christian faith yourself. Yes. Um, I mean, it is kind of curious. I think I was the one child in America, at least possibly the world, who who read the Chronicles of Narnia and did not know that Aslan was Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, did You'll not. make it up for it now. <laughs> yeah. Just but thought they were marvelous, did not yeah. know anything, read and loved The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings without mm. having any any understanding or even the slightest clue that there was any any Christian themes or material to it. But that is probably shared by many, many people today at yeah. that level. Perhaps more knowledge of the, the Christian overtones in Narnia, but most people are probably pretty ignorant of the, the Christian depths in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and maybe that's part of the power of the story, is mm-hmm. that he was not just trying to evangelize, yeah. um, that he was telling a really good story. Mm-hmm. That was his, mm-hmm. his, really his primary goal, and it certainly won me over as a girl. Um and, you know, and I enjoyed them purely in a literary way. Mm-hmm. Um, I went on, I did my, my PhD work on fantasy literature, wrote about both of them, centered it in the Lord of the Rings, was not a believer at that time. Um, so again, approaching this purely from a literary perspective, aware by then finally <laughs> that they were Christians. And it wasn't until after that, I had my PhD, I was, I was teaching that I, I started, you know, for, for various other, you know, reasons, sort of coming to grips with, you know, why do I want to be a good person? You know, what, what's the meaning of my life? Um, and alongside that, there was the the fact that, you know, all of my favorite authors were Christians, um, especially these two, who meant so much to me. And really, what was a, probably the, the most significant influence was simply that they were such good writers. Mm. Because I thought to myself, these, these authors are, are brilliant writers, they're brilliant thinkers, and yet they believe these things that seem crazy, stupid, ridiculous, but they're not stupid and ridiculous. So maybe, you know, maybe I've underestimated what they believe. Maybe there's a little bit more complexity than I thought. As Holly's academic career progressed, it wasn't only the fantasy works of Lewis and Tolkien that resonated with her. She loved the beauty of poetry and soon realised that many of the poets whose works struck the deepest chords, such as John Donne, Gerard Manley Hopkins and T.S. Eliot, wrote squarely from their Christian convictions. Holly recalls reading the opening of John Donne's sonnet. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, o'erthrow me and bend, your force to break, blow, burn and make me new. Holly says she felt like she had touched a live wire. It just resonated with something in me that, that made me think, you know, that the beauty of it was something more than just a purely aesthetic reaction. Mm. That it's really the same feeling that, you know, that I would get from, you know, from the most beautiful passages of Middle Earth or from reading the epilogue to, to Tolkien's essay on fairy stories. This is beautiful. This is compelling. And it seems to be sort of resonating with something that says, this is not just interesting or attractive on the surface. This, there seems to be some depth to it, some texture that, that, seems to be pursuing more. Uh, and of course, that doesn't in itself mean that the more exists. It doesn't mean that the, the more is true, but it means that it's worth looking into. Holly's growing admiration for the faith that infused the poetry and literature she loved led her to begin to investigate the Christian faith that these poets and authors believed in to test whether the emotional and imaginative world that enthralled her had any basis in history and fact. In time, she came to find, with the help of others, that there was substantive evidence for the historical truth claims of Christianity. And that really was the... the the sort of entry point to say, let me at least consider what they believe in a sort of neutral and objective way. Um, And I think that's an important thing to do regardless of whether anybody goes on to become a Christian or not, Mm. is to approach it and say, well, what's it from their perspective? Why do they believe what they believe? Um, That's just good to know, as opposed to projecting onto them, you must believe X, Y, and Z, because that's what I sort of vaguely think from the culture. And so that ended up, as it happens in my case, helping me to realize, oh, I, I, I believe this too. This makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I think that's, in a way, that's an attitude that I think is is really significant to have when you're approaching somebody whose beliefs differ from you. And I think 
Christians need to do this just as well. You know, if you're reading a biography or the work of someone who's an atheist, don't go into it thinking, well, that guy is really stupid. How can I find evidence of his stupidity? Well, no, if he's a reasonable human being, he has reasons for what he believes. Let's look at why he has arrived at these conclusions, which you can disagree with, um, but try to approach it in the best possible light. Yeah. And so that's something that, again, helped me to look into these questions and say, well, this seems this is striking some sort of resonance in, in me. Let me follow that. Mm. Let me follow that up. In many ways, Holly Ordway has been on a remarkably similar journey to one of her own literary heroes, C.S. Lewis, whose own story involved reconciling his love of literature, fantasy and poetry, the things he found most meaningful, with the everyday world of science, history and reason. In the end, it was the figure of Christ that reconciled the two halves of his mind, a real historical person who fulfilled all the hope, joy and deepest desires that he found in mythology, poetry and literature. As Lewis himself wrote, the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference, that it really happened. The deep joy Lewis experienced in literature and mythology was not an illusion, but had a source. The stories that seemed most meaningful to him were not lies, but contained the seeds of truth that were fulfilled in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. In this final episode of the first season of The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, I've tried to suggest three ways in which Christians can meet the incoming tide of faith. Firstly, keep Christianity weird. Let's confidently embrace the mystery, the challenge and weirdness of church and the Christian life. It's more attractive to others than you might realise. Secondly, create a community that counters cancel culture. We have to transcend the tribal divides that are tearing society apart. People are looking for a community of grace where they can ask their questions and put the pieces together again. And third, using the preeminent examples of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis as a model, I've encouraged the church to embrace both reason and imagination. People will only embrace the reasons for faith if they can imagine why they would want it to be true in the first place. That will mean today's artists, poets, writers, filmmakers, musicians, creatives, journalists, thinkers and communicators telling the timeless story in a fresh new way for our generation. The 16th century thinker Blaise Pascal put it succinctly, make religion attractive, make good men wish it were true, and then show that it is. Perhaps it's no surprise that similar C.S. Lewis-like journeys to faith occur among people who are themselves storytellers, poets and journalists. In the case of the adult convert, such as Paul Kingsnorth and Martin Shaw that we've met already, the journey of realisation only took place once other stories had been tried but had ultimately failed to make sense of things. The heights of human glory, the depths of human misery, the search for the meaning behind it all. Only the Christian story seemed to be able to encompass these things. Only the Christian story made sense of their stories. But such experiences are not limited to writers and poets. Throughout this podcast series, I've sought to show how an eclectic mix of historians, academics, musicians, scientists, psychologists, philosophers, and even actors and stand-up comedians have also been surprised to find that the Christian story makes sense of their stories and the story of the world around them. We began with the rise of new atheism and the shallowness of the story it told, which failed to unify even its own adherents and led to the implosion of the movement, leaving a generation still searching for meaning. And even how some sceptics, failed by new atheism's empty promises, such as Peter Byram and historian Sarah Irving Stonebreaker, were actually propelled towards faith by Richard Dawkins. Then we sketched the story of our present culture and how the influential psychologist Jordan Peterson seems to have become convinced that the person of Jesus connects the deepest stories of myth and meaning with our objective experience of the real world and the story of former new atheist Ian Hersey Alley as well, who, after experiencing spiritual bankruptcy, found God waiting for her. 
The story of history came next when we met the historian Tom Holland, who found himself confronted by a moral vision of the Western world that only really makes sense in light of the Christian story that birthed it. And we considered the story of the Bible itself and encountered Jonathan Haidt's surprise at the psychological depths of Scripture and journalist Douglas Murray's conflicted atheism over the one religious book that seems to be the key to civilization. And we also encountered the stories of historian Molly Worthen and classicist James Orr, for whom the person of Jesus stepped off the pages of the gospel to become a living reality. Next came the story of science, and I introduced a number of secular thinkers, such as Anthony Flew, Roger Penrose and Paul Davies, who have all come to believe that a purely materialist account of nature can't explain the universe and the life it has produced. Scientists such as Seigart and Rosalind Picard have crossed the line to Christian faith, believing that the universe itself points to the word, the logos, that first spoke order and life into being. Then came the story of mind versus materialism, when we heard of tech pioneer Jordan Hall's rebirth story and met psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist, who believes that only a divine mind explains the human capacity for consciousness. We also met Christian converts such as Jennifer Fulweiler, who abandoned her materialism in the search for meaning, and Ashley Landy, whose search for transcendence in psychedelics led her to the cross of Christ. And finally, we've explored the story of religion itself and the contention that even in a secular age, people are no less religious. They just worship different things. And that despite the faults and failings of the church, we may be seeing rumblings of revival in Gen Z as a new generation looks for meaning again in ancient places. Through all of this, the story of Jesus seems to connect these different strands of culture, history, and science. His story makes sense of all stories, past, present, and future. C.S. Lewis was at the forefront of confronting the growing meaning crisis in his generation, as he saw the materialist paradigm establishing a stronghold in academia and beginning to trickle into popular culture. That trickle has become a flood in the intervening years, but what if the many stories we've met so far in this series of the many people surprised by God are merely the first fruits of those making their way out of the meaning crisis in our generation? Could the tide be turning? I think it is. Tides go out and tides come in, and human history seems to mirror nature with its own repetitive cycles as nations rise and fall, empires come and go the cultural influence of religion is likewise prone to ebb and flow. Christianity has been remarkably successful until now. It flourished in the East and then swept the Western world. It's dominated art, literature and culture and left majestic cathedrals in its wake. The revivals of Luther, Wesley and Whitfield transformed Europe and America before Christianity swept into Africa, Asia, Latin America and the rest of the world. From a secular perspective, it's possible to compare these high watermarks of the past with the current picture in the West and assume that Christianity, if not quite dead, is well on its way to being another relic of history. What the critics often fail to realise is that the crest of each new wave of Christianity had a trough that preceded it. History moves in cycles, tides go out and come back in. And I believe we're simply living at low tide in the Western world. G.K. Chesterton once said, Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. Rebirth has happened before, and I believe it can happen again in our generation. Some 2,000 years ago, a wandering rabbi stood on a beach and called a bunch of fishermen to put down their nets, follow him, and fish for people instead. Together, they changed the world. Like them, I believe we are standing on the shores of human history, waiting for a tide that is about to rush back in. Perhaps now is the time to answer his call again.
Thank you for listening to the surprising rebirth of belief in God. This is the end of season one, but it's certainly not the end of the podcast. Since I launched this documentary series 11 months ago, I've been astounded by the number of people getting in touch with their own stories of rebirth and the many public examples of people coming to faith and rumours of new life in the church at large. I'd love to hear more of those stories and you can get in touch by emailing me justin at justinbriley.com. I believe that we are perhaps only at the beginning of this cultural moment. I don't know exactly where this movement is heading or what the future holds, but I'm keen to continue telling the stories of Surprising Rebirth. So we'll be taking a break over the next few months as we bring together more documentary episodes, interviews and live shows for the launch of Season 2 in January 2025. In the meantime, why not encourage others you know who might enjoy season one to go and listen from the start in full. This first season has been made possible thanks to the tremendous hard work of our editor, Isaac Simmons, and Think Faith's operation manager, Peter Byram. So thank you, Isaac and Peter. And thanks also to all the guests, contributors and advisors who have given their time to the series and those who have helped to host live events during the season two. This first season has also been made possible by the incredible generosity of people from all over the world who've come on board to support the work of my new production company, Think Faith, as we produce this series and other resources in video, print and live events. If you've enjoyed the podcast so far and want to help fund our next season as we seek to cover the staffing, the editing and running costs, please consider supporting via regular giving on Patreon or a one-off gift via PayPal. If you're in the USA, we also have a link to support via tax-deductible giving. Monthly silver supporters get early access to episodes plus bonus content. Gold supporters also get signed books and the chance for a monthly catch-up with me. Supporters can now also get immediate early access to full video interviews that I've recorded for this series with people like Tom Holland, Bishop Barron, N.T. Wright, Sarah Irving Stonebreaker, Dennis Noble, Perry Marshall and many, many more. So lots of reasons to become a silver or gold supporter as we conclude season one and head towards season two. Go to justinbriley.com or you can find the links with today's show. I can't tell you how much it means to me personally when you support these efforts of mine to bring thinking faith to the secular and Christian world. Thank you so much. Material on today's episode from The Unbelievable Show was used by permission of Premier. Visit premierunbelievable.com for full shows. Into Your Arms was used by permission of BMG and Nick Cave. You can find links to all archive materials used in this episode with today's show notes. And in case you need reminding one last time, this podcast series is also a book. You can read the first chapter for free when you join my newsletter at justinbriley.com, where you can also order the book or get a signed copy. As ever, please subscribe to this podcast, rate and review us, share it on your socials, or why not just send it on to a friend and tell them to start binging from episode one. Thank you for being part of this journey so far. See you again soon as we launch season two in January. Hi, friends. Just as we close out today, I recently received this review of the podcast from Michael, who wrote... This is a terrific series, intelligent and nuanced, and I write that as a non-Christian, though someone much interested in these topics. If you're enjoying this series and you'd like to help me reach even more people with thinking faith, please do consider supporting the show. Silver supporters get early access to episodes and bonus content. Gold supporters also get signed books and a monthly catch-up with me. The links to support are with the show notes or visit justinbriley.com.